Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Mark Gato, so I work with the Department of Transportation in the Environmental and Transportation Services Division. I'll be the moderator for this session. And uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to try to actually have a panel discussion. And our, our panel today includes Jeremy Gordon with the City of Fargo, Jacob Nordwick with SRF Consulting Group, Kevin Bro. Mike Johnson with the North Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, behind me or on the screens, we're going to run some screenshots of some complete street concepts. It's just a bunch of pictures. We're going to let it uh, continuously flow as we go through it uh, so you see some of the pictures and, and get some of the ideas. Um, the intent of today's presentation is to give just a general concept of complete streets and how we integrate that into a normal project development process. And so we'll talk about a couple projects that way. And, uh, and they can be big projects or little projects. Uh, as we look at it, uh, I'll say conceptually, complete, complete streets means looking at using, I'm going to say, all of the right of way uh, in a manner that uh, is good for all the users, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, uh, shared rider services, freight delivery, uh, and also the motorist. Um, the reality is, is, is all the users want the same thing, and, and that's safety and connectivity. It was interesting yesterday listening to Tim uh, uh, from the Federal Highway Administration, and uh, he talked about the intersections, and one of the things he talked about is improving safety and improving the movements for mobility of pedestrians as we make different intersection alternatives. So it's, it's kind of just if you think what's, you think what's best for motorists. I think the other thing that's uh, really interesting is, is when you look at our roads, and, and a lot of them uh, uh, go back several years, uh, in the concept in the 50s and 60s, really uh, worked on uh, traffic operations, level of service, crashes, and, and standards. And so those things developed over time. And uh, when we look at the project that we're going to talk about a little bit today, uh, Fargo Main Avenue project, it had a whole bunch of right-of-way. And, and the road in between was only about 24 feet wide. Well, now we got a road that's about 60 feet wide. And, and so there was a lot of right-of-way, a lot of things that were used uh, by the businesses, by the public in place at that time. Uh, traditional thinking when I started working was uh, we needed everything had to be 12-foot lanes. And boy, the best thing you could do was build a five-lane section. Uh, we built them out. In 1984, they published the first Green Book. And uh, before it was a green book, there was a red book and there was a blue book. One was rural and, and one was urban. They had that, but that started in 84. That really was the big push of the standards. And, and if you know the green book, it's called a guide, but it really became one of those things where uh, it, it, you took a table in the green book and said it had to be this way. Well, eventually, uh, Ice-T came along in the early 1990s, and Ice-T was the uh, Intermodal Surface Transportation and Efficiency Act, and that provided funding, and it promoted flexibility in roadway design so we could tar start taking some of the concepts and working with them. So as, as we have it, and if you look at complete street, stra complete street strategies, is understanding the community and the network really meaning how does it affect the people that use the road and that work along the road, the businesses, or, the, or they live along the road. Identifying the safety and connectivity and equity concerns, uh, implementing uh, coordinated improvements. Maybe we're doing a reconstruction project today or we're going to implement this piece at a piece as we go along. And the last thing is just uh, monitoring and having success. So as you look at it, and you know, I'll say complete streets, when you listen to the presentation, I think you'll find that it's taking an intentional look at the usage of the highway right away. And, and as you do that, it's like to say you, you've got cars and motorists, um, but there is things like when we impact a business and, and you 
have to either relocate that business or you impact their parking or how they function uh, in, in their flow and operation. So a lot of things happen with it. And uh, so we'll start off with the presentations. And uh, Kevin, you're first up. Uh, what does complete streets mean to Federal Highway Administration? Well, uh, first of all, uh, nice to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad you're here. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the conversation we're going to have. And we are going to have a conversation, aren't we? Yes. Uh, so complete streets from a federal highway point of view, it's not a design standard. It's not a regulation. It's not a requirement. It, it's kind of uh, a good policy. And um, when I think of s complete streets from my perspective as an engineer, it's changed over time. But federal highways has kind of recognized those changes. And they would say a complete safe for all users. And that doesn't just mean putting a sidewalk in, in a roadway where, which was originally designed for vehicles, where you got a great level of service and maximum capacity for those vehicles. It would be a, a street that would you know, meet uh, the needs of those that would use it. And not, there is no one stop fix for, for every single situation, but you have to think of the people that use it. And that would be the folks that walk it, uh, the folks that might ride a bike on it, the folks that might stand on the corner waiting for a bus to stop, and uh, then there's going to be the vehicles that would also use it. And it needs to be safe. The less distance you would cross the street, uh, in other words, the less lanes that you would cross would be better for the pedestrians and safer. Uh, vehicle speed, there's a safe uh, concept out there that less speed is better. So those would be some of the things that Federal Highways would say are important parameters to, to look at. And um, I, I could write down a, or say a bunch of other things as well, and I think we'll get to it in our conversation. So. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And Mike, you're up next. And the question is, uh, how has the project development incorporated these concepts in the DOT? Yeah, so a couple things I just so some of you looking at the pictures in front of you, the start of the presentation had a lot of before and after slides. So if you saw some pictures that didn't look like complete streets yet, there's a reason for that. Um, forgot to remind Mark that, that we were doing that. And then kind of spitballing off of what Kevin just said, um, you know, need to take a little credit here. Federal Highway is really, really good about uh, providing new policy or emphasis areas as a precursor to eventual requirements that must be followed. <laughs> So give him a little credit for that part. He didn't want to dive too far into that. But what I'll say with Complete Streets, uh, it is a new emphasis area, but I don't think it's a new concept to a lot of us in terms of how we approach our projects and, and incorporate those things into our projects. Um, the department looks at Complete Streets uh, through all levels of our projects, whether through scoping or during the actual design and project development stages. I think the implementation of these ideas is kind of uh, approach from a measured and applicability standpoint. It may not apply to every project, depending on the scope of that current project or what that project actually entails. Um, in other cases, you know, if it's a really small scale project, you might do minor things. If it's a mill and overlay, maybe you can do some minor things uh, with the pavement marking changes. But if it's a more reconstruction project, larger scale, that opens up the rainbow of opportunities for you to incorporate complete streets on a project. And that's how the department approaches it early on as we work through our process. OK, Jeremy, why don't you let us know uh, what the city of Fargo likes to do for policies? <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, got a couple things before we get into the meat of this. Is um, A guy from Federal Highway, a guy from North Dakota DOT, and a consulting engineer walk into a bar. You think one of them would have seen it? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, and then, so this panel, this is the first time I've been on a panel. This is, this is great. So, you know, usually you prepare a PowerPoint. So there's, there's a beauty of preparing a PowerPoint so you can uh, actually have something to talk about and reference. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of freewheeling here, but uh, thanks for having me. This is a great conference. Um, what does Complete Streets mean to the city of Fargo? Uh, the beauty of working for a city versus a, state or federal highway, 
Uh, our system is, you know, self-contained. This is, it's a network onto itself. Um, so we really, we've got a network for our sidewalks, got a network for our paths, we've got a network for uh, some on-street bike lanes and uh, for our section line roads and collector streets. So, um, you know, luckily, City of Fargo, way back when, decades and decades ago, made it a city ordinance to put uh, sidewalks on, on each side of every street that they build. So if you really look at the City of Fargo sidewalk network, it's probably phenomenal um, compared to others in the nation. Um, so really, us designers on staff, um, take, taking that into consideration, we really, uh, when we design new streets or we redesign, you know, water main replacement uh, in, in the built environment, we got to be very aware of the context that the street sits in and uh, accommodate the users as best as we can. Um, not all streets are going to function the same. So within the city, you know, uh, state, federal, they deal with a lot of arterial, mostly arterial roads. Um, on the city, it goes all the way down to the local level. So we've got a lot, uh, a lot of vari uh, variety in our, in, the, in our finished product on our complete streets. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, next is Jacob. Uh, Jacob, you've got the privilege of working on the uh, project and, and working through the environmental document and preliminary engineering. Uh, from a consultant perspective, uh, how, how did you implement complete streets on the Fargo, Maine? Well, Fargo, Maine is an example, but you know the way that consultants view complete streets or I uh, view complete streets is it's an opportunity. Right? It's an opportunity to hear the needs, the wants, you know, what are the priorities of, of a corridor. You know, those priorities often change throughout years. You know, when you're doing a reconstruct, you know, there's, there's, an, there's an opportunity there to, to get it right for, for the future. And what, what are the current needs, what are the future needs. And that, that's for all modes. You know, in the past, vehicles were always the focus. Right? Let's take care of the vehicles and then whatever's left over. What, what, can we, what can we do for, for the rest of the modes? You know, that, that view has changed here over the last years. And, you know, Fargo Main Avenue was a prime example. You know, there's a corridor study that was done in 2013. And when we got to the environmental preliminary design, you know, what came out of that corridor study as recommendation was not what, what ended up moving forward. And that's, that's just understanding all those different modes of transportation, whether it's your peds, your bikes, transit, you know, your cars, trucks, all those are important when you're considering your design for, for these. And really the goal is you want to create a safe and inviting environment for all users. All those users, you know, everything that I just mentioned is, isn't going to be uh, a necessity for your corridor because all corridors are different but you want to make sure you're maximizing uh, the safety and an in, in inviting environment for those users to be able to come there you know for example if uh, pedestrians you know the walkability is, is not quite there you want to make sure that it is there when, when you're all said and done you want people to come to the corridor you know to use it either for that corridor or as, as a mode for connectivity to other other areas throughout the, the region uh, that you're working in there so um, you know and, and for implementation purposes communication is, is key and that's communications between the, the consultant the designer uh, but really it's the stakeholders that are involved you know getting understanding those priorities uh, getting getting out and, and talking with the public understanding what their priorities what their needs and wants are and really bringing that all, all forward because public perception sometimes is different than, than the agency per perception of what what's important so I think it's early on it's it's very important to understand what what those are so you can bring forth options and, and opportunities uh, to carry forward okay thank you Jacob Jeremy um, as you work to engage the stakeholders, uh, what type of topics do you try to have a discussion with uh, as you meet with them? <laughs> well, um, I could tell another joke about North Dakota DOT, but I won't. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, like I, like I said, first, first go around, um, you know, like Main Avenue or even when you think of Fargo, uh, Broadway, those are what you would probably consider um, like signature complete streets. You know, they're pretty, there's got a landscape architecture, there's uh, 
quite a bit of on-street parking to service the businesses. But there's there's lesser streets that also we have a lot of flexibility in our design. Um, you just you really you notice the details on Main and Broadway because they're just high prior higher profile streets. So when when you dig in, you know it's easy to talk about complete streets from a high level, but when you start to uh, build new streets and reconstruct streets, there's there's always questions that come up during design. I know a lot of you consultants that work for us. Uh, uh, I know you pull your hair, pull your hair out quite a bit, but uh, we get a great finished product. So you know whether we're uh, reconstructing or new constructing, there's all kinds of questions. Uh, what's the land use that we're adjacent to? You know, it 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 uh, changes if you're in a commercial industrial area, uh, or if you're in the downtown core, or if you're in the suburban type area. The needs of the users are different. You don't need on street parking in the suburban areas for to, to walk into a business. So, uh, for example. So, um, another thing on on the city side is we've got a we've done a pretty good job making a, a on street bike net network. So the first question we ask is, this is, is the street going to be impacting an on, on-road bike facility? Um, and what we found over the years is uh, the on-road bike facilities do great in the kind of the built older part of town. But in, as you get uh, a mile or two away from the downtown, folks really like the shared use path systems versus being on the street. So the question is, uh, when, we, when we do the street, are we, how are the bikes going to be impacted? Um, and what type of street is it? Arterial, collector, local? Uh, how wide is the right of way? Are there any facilities that are missing? I think we've done a lot of great jobs filling in gaps as we've reconstructed. Um, you know, the one thing, another thing about the, a growing city that Fargo is, we've done a ton of projects. I've been around 20 years, and we've done hundreds of them. So, in every project, uh, we try to improve what uh, what it used to be like. Um, you know, is this is it, is the road on a transit route? Um, what's the speed limit? Can the speed limit be lowered? How many lanes are there? What's the ADT? Um, is, there, is the design going to be urban with curb and gutter? Is it going to be rural? Can we fit in the path on a rural somehow? Um, is there on-street parking? This is probably, if you learn anything from me today, on-street parking, keeping it or removing it is probably the most controversial thing there is with these streets, at least in Fargo. Um, you really got to be aware of what's happening there currently and what you really want to happen there in the future. Some are pretty simple, some are pretty basic, and some are pretty controversial, uh, like yelling at people in city hall. So um, can we reduce lanes? Um, you know, some of our, the grid network in the older part of Fargo, you know, there's a street to every block. So there's not a lot of capacity on most of the streets in the built area. Also, can we, can we reduce lanes? And we really did that in downtown um, along the river. It used to be a five lane road, now it's basically a two lane road. Uh, Fourth Street used to be, a I can't believe it. it used to be a four-lane road. There's hardly any traffic on it. Uh, we easily reduced that road diet and putting in uh, bike lanes. So I think that covers it. Right. I, had, I had it turned on. I had it turned on. It's a two-second rule, and I think I can leave them turned on at the same time now. So anyways, uh, thank you, Jeremy. And, and then, Jacob, as you work through the uh, process of meeting with the stakeholders, uh, including the city and the DOT, what are some of the things that came about uh, uh, relative to uh, the project? Well, it's for, you know, discussing what are the needs and all that, but it's really the right sizing of the project, you know, taking those discussions that you've had and, uh, and applying them. And, and a lot of times that can be done through through discussion of what, what are the, the opportunities. You know, you can have a laundry list of, of things that you can do to enhance and, and provide more safety for the corridor for all the users. Um, but that corridor might be different as well um, from one end to the other. And that was the case with the Fargo Main Avenue project. You know, you're going from a downtown district heading, heading to the west, which comes, be, uh, you know, downtown you got building face to building face to work with, you know, there's not a lot of room. And then as you get further, further away, it opens up a little bit. And it's more commercial with a lot more access points and stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of factors to do, to consider. And I mean, this applies to all projects, whether you're in an urban downtown setting, a neighborhood, or even in a rural area. There, there are opportunities to install or, or enhance it through the complete streets process. You know, some examples, you know, uh, that you could, could do is, is, you know, intersection control. I know FHWA had a uh, presentation yesterday 
about intersection control and, and different things you can do, uh, whether that's roundabouts. You know, we, we installed a roundabout at 2nd Street in, in Maine. Uh, that was a very, very wide intersection. It was a signalized intersection. Uh, there's pictures that'll pop up on there on the slideshow, but um, it was a dangerous intersection. There were a lot of crashes at that intersection. And, and we ended up doing a, a what we call a hybrid roundabout where you know, each leg of the roundabout had different uh, lane configurations as far as number of lanes entering and, and exiting the roundabout. And, and really it was kind of that, that intersection was a way to provide that transition, but it was also really viewed as a gateway into Fargo because you're coming from, from the Minnesota side from Moorhead. It's really a, featured as a gateway. You know, this is, you're entering downtown. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a nice feature there. So, you know, landscaping pieces that were involved. Uh, curb bump outside intersections uh, is, is becoming very, very popular and a necessity. Uh, you know, that provides shorter pedestrian crossings, you know, safer for pedestrians, but, but in, in addition to the safeties for pedestrians with the shorter crossings, better sight distance, not only for the, the pedestrians, for oncoming vehicles, but also the vehicles themselves, seeing the pedestrians um, before they enter the intersection. So that, that's, that's another nice enhancement that, that has been utilized, you know, throughout the state is, is the curb bump outs. Uh, on-street parking, Jeremy mentioned on-street parking. You know, that's, it's definitely a contra controversial uh, subject uh, whether you're, you're adding parking or, or taking away parking, but, but parking does, if, if you're able to do it, it does provide that barrier between the, the vehicles and the pedestrians as well. So it, it enhances, you know, that safety aspect of it. Uh, you know, other features that can, can, you know, provide more of that enhancing, that inviting environment, you know, landscaping features, whether it's planting beds, uh, boulevards, whether grass or, or decorative concrete boulevards, uh, trees, you know, those things all, you know, provide a little bit of a barrier, you know, define that, that walking space for the pedestrians, for the users. Safety and, and comfort uh, for those users. Uh, other things that you can do to enhance your, your project is, you know, the types of lighting you use. Are you going to use your standard, you know, 40-foot DOT light? Or is something more decorative, maybe maybe a, a 30 foot um, lighting unit. Uh, pedestrian lighting also is is something that that could be incorporated too to, to provide that safety and that inviting. Um, and then another thing for pedestrian crossings, sometimes they're limited at intersections. Does it make sense to do a pedestrian crossing at a mid block? Uh, and then you know, with Fargo Main Avenue, we had two mid block crossings added at Seventh and and over by uh, 10th Street. One of them, we, we installed a hawk signal to provide that additional safety um, because there wasn't really any close intersections to, to cross, so we, we provided that, that crossing at that location. So there, there's a lot of opportunities you can do, and it's just a matter of having those communications internally with your stakeholders to identify what, what, what makes sense for the corridor that you're working on. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Kevin, from uh, Federal Highway's perspective, how do you uh, incorporate complete streets? Well, we tell the folks that are receiving federal funds to do it our way. <laughs> and usually that's when we get in arguments, right, Mike? Um, yeah, oh, yes, right. We have a conversation. Um, what was the question again? Well, we, we don't really have projects, just so you all know. We just throw money at you folks that have projects. And um, we, we hope you do the right thing. And we, we do everything we can to cajole you and convince you that you should go this direction, not that direction. And, um, but um, if, I, if I were to look at and say what would be a kind of project that we would say is a, is a project that we'd want to see would be the one that, that makes everybody happy, including us, and um, uses the federal funds in, the, in that fashion as well. So right now the door is wide open in the way Federal Highways is moving, in my opinion. We're looking at local streets as one of the major components of everything we do. We're not just looking at highways and freeways. We're looking at making the highway work for everybody. So a project that's context sensitive, and each one of these projects has a, has a context, and you don't just build a project to make the pavement better. You don't make a project just to make it so that it can get more vehicles from point A to point B faster. You need to look at it as a fully encompassed right of way that, that is used by everybody that can possibly use it and needs to use it. And if you proceed with projects and you ignore those other users, 
I think we'd probably have a, a conversation, wouldn't we, Mike? And um, so, you know, I, I'm thinking of a, a past life. I wasn't always a federal agent. <coughs> and um, I worked for a highway department, and we used to permit uh, a lot of things on our local roads, which were also highways. But in the old days, those roads were just straight old two-lane highways. Nobody lived on maybe a couple homes. And as time went by, a community developed around them. And usually the right-of-way wasn't wide enough, and we would allow for those local agencies to build sidewalks, and they could barely fit the sidewalks on those roads. And then the you know traffic got worse, and we had to widen those roads because it was all about the vehicles. And now we're going back, and we're reducing those lane widths, and we're putting sidewalks out there because those communities have grown, and I and I think we need to look at it from a community point of view as well as just a point A to point B point of view. And then uh, I had another thought, and I think it's leaking out of my head as I speak, but um, what was it? I'll, I'll come up with it when we get in our discussion part where we go back and forth. So I hope that answers the question, whatever you it remember? was that he asked. Well, you know, you, you curbed my imagination there because I remember when I first started working for the DOT uh, at Federal Highway, you did wear badges, didn't you? They were the nice red gold one. And, and, uh, and kind of like I mentioned uh, earlier on, they, uh, they would come around and they would tell us 12-foot lanes, you know, traffic volumes, uh, got to improve the level of service or you're not going to get any funding. Then I said it with iced tea, we had some new things. We had flexibility in roadway design. His badge changed there. It, it turned a, a nicer color because we were getting friendlier again. And, and Kevin mentioned uh, context-sensitive design and context-sensitive solutions. All of those over time became kind of federal highway initiatives, and, and they all have the same thing in common. How can we get the community involved and get community uh, stakeholders uh, helping us make decisions on the highways. So as we have that, uh, I'll turn it to Mike and say, Mike, uh, we talked a lot about Fargo Main Avenue. You were involved in that. What are some of the other projects where we're using these concepts? Yeah, first of all, I didn't realize Federal Highway thought they were federal agents. That's an interesting... <laughs> and, and to spin off of Mark's name tag issue, I mean, look at him now. He's got his name tag turned around, so we can't even tell who he is. Federal agent, the secrets, the secrets. I see how this goes. Beware. So yes, Fargo Main Avenue. Um, it, it was a, a very recent and very large project that was was completed in conjunction with the department, the city, and and SRF and their team. And um, but we have had other projects that uh, across the state that have implemented complete streets very successfully. And uh, there's pictures of all of the projects I'm going to mention here within these slides. Um, well, since this one's up, I'll talk about this one first. And Dickinson on the West Business Loop, this is a rural two-lane portion of the business loop, but we had a major disconnection from uh, a pedestrian need. Uh, there's a brand new middle school constructed on the north side of the interstate, and a majority of the students that attended that school lived south of the interstate. So they were riding their bicycle on our two-lane roadway that didn't really have shoulders, and then crossing an interstate structure that also didn't really have any shoulders. So working with the city, we uh, implemented a pedestrian bridge over the interstate to accommodate that movement. So I think that's a good example of complete streets doesn't necessarily have to mean, well, we're not doing recon, so we don't really have to worry about it. I think that's a perfect example of that was a need and uh, that was a way to provide additional safety um, uh, movements for those pedestrians, those students going to school. Another one is Williston Main Street very similar to Fargo, Maine. It was a downtown roadway, four lane with parking. Um, Adam's here, he designed that project. And uh, we changed that road to a road diet uh, with parking, added bulb outs, other aesthetic treatments. Uh, so that one was a big change for downtown. Um, we had pretty good buy-in from the beginning. There wasn't too much, too much uh, pushback from that one. Um, but also lessons learned, uh, we put some raised planners within the bulb out area and found out post construction that we got them a little bit too close to the curb. Um, they basically are built like a Jersey barrier, but people were kind of nicking them as they were parking in there. So a little bit of lessons learned on that one. Um, 
Also in Dickinson, we had the East Business Loop, so that was the other end of Dickinson. Uh, that project was also a two-lane rural roadway with ditches. Um, it was in need of repair and widening, so we uh, widened that road to a three-lane with curb and gutter, but still maintained the ditches for a hybrid section. But there were zero pedestrian facilities for that entire length, so we added a shared use path and also added roadway lighting that didn't exist as well to help with the... Um, um, traffic on the road and also light the path. So we um, added an element there to um, enhance the complete streets and the users utilizing that roadway. Grand Forks to Mers Avenue, um, a lot of you are probably familiar with that, it's very similar to Fargo, Maine and Williston Main Street. Um, that roadway already had a three lane section, so we didn't change the typical section, but we added some um, additional enhancements and aesthetic treatments uh, to that roadway as well. Uh, Fargo 10th Street was also in here. That's one. We didn't rebuild the road, but we added some bike lanes. We added a um, Hawk pedestrian crossing, and we added some transit stops. Uh, the bike lanes had the green pavement marking through the intersections to enhance that movement uh, for those um, um, bikes utilizing the corridor. Uh, so there, yeah, those are some other examples that we've done across the state. It's a trick. <laughs> so I'm going to just take a, qu a quick break because we have more things that we want to talk about. But is there anybody that's got a question out in the audience uh, where, where they got that question right now and they'd like to ask it? It's a, a bit of a loaded question, but, but uh, yes, uh, so your question is, uh, what does Federal Highway say to the, the users of the roadway that do not contribute to the taxes that would otherwise cover the cost of, you know, the Federal Highway program over and against building those projects back up or repairing and whatever? Uh, I would say this, when you... Uh, when you drive a vehicle, you can't do so unless you get it licensed. Is that true? Okay. When you're a pedestrian, do you need to get a license to walk in the right of way of the public? No. I would think maybe that might answer that question. I hope. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Any other questions? We'll, we'll move on a little bit. I think one of the things uh, that I would just emphasize as there's other users to a project uh, that maybe don't contribute to the gas fund, um, they're all using that right away. Um, uh, a lot of the businesses there, like say, if you think about many of our streets that were built in the 1930s, 1940s, um, they, they didn't have big cars, they didn't have big trucks. Uh, when you went to downtown Fargo, there's, there's a whole lot of spots in the front of businesses where they had coal chutes and they deliver coal, they deliver uh, uh, materials, they de uh, deliver retail supplies, a and those were there. So there was a lot of uses for that street beyond just the people uh, driving the motorist. It was a place where people could go and they picked up their supplies and goods. And so you got to think about the whole concept of everybody who's using that street. Mike wants to go. I'll just add another element to that. That it's a good question, Dustin. Um, just like, I'm not a no, no it's a good question. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's six of them in the public meeting. Three of them talk, and three stew in the corner. So that it, it's a good question. Uh, I think another element to realize is that without even knowing it, they are potentially paying for part of that, or are a contributing funding user. Because in a case like Fargo Main Avenue, if we're making those facilities. Uh, more adaptable, more friendly, more useful. There's more pedestrian traffic. They're, attend they're um, patrons to those businesses and those restaurants that might be on that corridor, which then contributes to sales tax. And then a lot of our cities use that sales tax to reinvest back into their roadways for maintenance or paying their match for those roadways. So it may not be a direct correlation from matching at that, st at that standpoint or paying a fuel tax or a license fee, as Kevin mentioned, but 
there is an element there that they are a contributing member to that corridor through some other avenue. Sure you can, Kevin. I don't want to bury my, my comment. It sounded rather short and to the point, but I've, no one really thinks about the fact that uh, it, the right-of-way that the federal government is involved in is for the public. And most of the right-of-way right for street well, the hard part is paying for it, as you, as you mentioned. Sidewalks crack, and they have to be fixed. They have to be maintained. So uh, unfortunately, um, on the main highway system, we don't have the best identified funds for that. But we also don't have a way of preventing them to be used by the public. And, and I'm thinking the pedestrians in this case, as I think you brought forth, they're, you know, public funds, doing the right thing with them has always been a hard, you know, way to spread the peanut butter across all of the, the needs of America. And you can see, in, you know, currently and with Federal Highway, our budget's different than it was you know, four years ago. We relied so much on the, on the um, trust fund and the gas tax, and now we're, we're expanding that. So that means other users are gonna benefit from it. And I thought of the thing I, remember when I was talking earlier, I couldn't remember what I wanted to remember? I remembered it. Um, I've always said this, and I think it's true, especially with cities. Um, it's very hard to take a road that's already been, you know, maximized to the edge of the right of way and for the use of the vehicles as well, and then expand it without having some major impacts. And it usually involves citizens that may have invested their, their livelihood in a business or a home, and we're taking that right away away because we're gonna make more room for whatever we're gonna make more room for. But I will say this, and I'm an engineer, and I've designed projects that, that were harder than, you know, it seems simple, but they're extremely hard to build and design and not make someone frustrated or upset with us. Good planning makes great engineering. Does anybody think that's a, a bad thing? I've seen some city streets that are just just the right formula for that particular area. So it comes down to good planning. And I think that's one of the things that the federal government would also emphasize. So um, for what that matters, it would make a lot of our lives easier so if we had good planning. So this is a thumbs up to good planners. Thank you, Kevin. You tricked me again. I know, I'm sorry. All right, I'll use the one that's turned on. So anyways, I deviated from the schedule to make sure we, we were kind of uh, lively with the group here. So I'll go back in the end, and I'm skipping in our presentation. And, uh, and I'm going to say, Jacob, uh, one of the things we talked about uh, prior to doing this was uh, we discover that we all have opinions. And uh, much as anybody who knows me, I have a lot of opinions, but uh, I'll say they don't always make sense. So uh, with that, uh, how do you go about uh, uh, steering and, and gathering the opinions and then giving, getting everybody uh, pointing in the same direction? Well, really, it's everyone has their opinions, like you said, but it's getting consensus, and that's the, the name of the, the topic here is building consensus. You know, the DOT may not have the same views and, and priorities as the city does. And, and how do you come together to, you know, get consensus? You know, there's priorities, there's trade-offs that, that need to be taken into consideration. You know, what's, what's important? You know, what is important to the agency? What's important to the community, uh, the users? You know, that plays in, into that decision-making. Um, but really, it's the communication working together is, is really what brings that in. I know, you know, Fargo Main Avenue, for example, uh, it's kind of like the extreme example that we're, we're referring to here, but, you know, there was a lot of behind-the-scenes conversations between the city and the DOT on what makes sense, what should we move forward, you know, because there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And, and, you know, we just got done talking about from the question is cost. You know, who's responsible for that cost? You know, depending on your funding, there may be an allowance to, to provide some of these, these complete streets features. You know, what is that allowance? You know, does the city want to do more than that? And if they are, you know, are they on the hook for, for additional costs beyond that allowance? You know, those are the conversations that need to be had of really determine what can you move forward. 
you know, there are other factors too that, that you have to talk about in order to decide what, what makes sense. And um, maintenance is a big one. I, I haven't heard maintenance be brought up yet, but who's responsible for the maintenance? You know, we live, we live in North Dakota, you know, we have nice weather for six months out of the year and, you know, iffy weather the, the rest of the six months. And, you know, snow, you know, we dealt with it, you know, as part of this conference with, with snowing happening and potential for, you know, travel concerns. How, how are these facilities maintained? Who's responsible? You know, is it going to be the DOT? Is it going to be the city? That may play into the, the decision making of what, what you want to move forward. You know, those are, those are things that you really need to work through and determine early on to, to find that vision because everyone's vision is different, but the goal is to, to make that vision a consensus building to, to an agreement on, on how to best approach move forward because everyone that's involved in, in a project wants to do the right thing for, for everyone. And that's, that's really the, the, the main goal. Thank you, Jacob. So, Mike, that brings up the question we had for you. How do you deal with construction and maintenance? Yeah, that's a good, good one. So we do all this groundwork and lay all our baselines of trying to get buy-in from uh, the public and interested stakeholders on complete streets elements, and we finally reach that point. And then the next question is, oh, how, how, we, we can't maintain that. How are we going to do that? So then you almost kind of start that process over with uh, maintenance staff and elected leaders to get them to understand that uh, while there may be changes and um, revisions to how you maintain that roadway or that facility today, uh, there are others that have done it before you. There are ways to make that happen, optimized opportunities to make that new process more efficient, and, it, and it's a hurdle that can be overcome. It's not something that should stand in the way. It's a con conversation and it's an element of it, but it's not a, not a game changer. I think mean, it's a, very important to have those conversations and, and work through that process, but it's kind of like a, a two-step thing, getting buy-in to implement those things and then trying to get buy-in to make sure that uh, maintenance is something that can be done. And then there may be items too that you're like, we really want to do this, but you know maybe we got to make it a little bit smaller, uh, or slight revisions where we can still have it and still accommodate the maintenance needs of, of the uh, whoever may be maintaining it, if it's a state agency, a local agency, or, or whomever. I checked this time. So Jeremy. Uh, Mike talked about getting the buy-in. Uh, what kind of things does the city of Fargo do to get that buy-in? It's our way or the highway. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I tell you, you know, this has been great uh, planning for this. I think we had eight or ten Zoom meetings, uh, kind of BSing back and forth. So th it's great to freewheel like this. You all hit on really good things. Um, you talked about planning. Planning is phenomenal to work with. We've got a great planning department. Um, we uh, had a downtown planning study done for our downtown framework. It highlighted what streets should be focused for cars, what other streets should be focused for bikes, what streets should be pedestrian streets. Streets. So it's a playbook. It's it's. Uh, I didn't think I was going to say this, but it's like a page out of Brad Childress's playbook when he had the uh, the great offense for the Vikings. Uh, but we just look at the playbook. We open it up and like, oh, this street's got to be this, and it's going to have this, this, and this, and the dimensions are going to be this. So it's phenomenal. And then uh, you talk about Fargo Main. Fargo Main's a great project. Um, but on that, so you know, sometimes there's varying levels of how you can change things. So sometimes it's easy. Like if a four-lane road has a 3,000 vehicles a day daily traffic, you don't need four lanes. You need two. So it's simple to take the, some of the street away and give it to something else. Fargo, Maine is a different example. It had 15 to 20,000 cars. We're going to shrink the lanes. Hey, are we gonna, where are all these other cars going to go? You got to be creative in how you can get people off that street. So far, I mean, Maine Avenue, I mean, I, I'm a traffic engineer. I love moving traffic efficiently. We removed two signals um, and replaced one of them with a roundabout. Um, we allowed the uh, counterflow on university. So if you're coming in downtown, there's a, you know, people are paying tens of millions. Moorhead's going to pay over 100 million for a grade separation. We had a grade separation on university that was just one way. Well, hey, let's just use the two way just for a block so we can get a bunch of cars off Main Avenue. Um, and then we've got the variable message boards to warn people of trains coming into the downtown. So, I mean, 
you got to get creative. Enhancements are, are wonderful. And then um, I'm not over at the Public Works Department removing snow, but uh, let me tell you, if you haven't been to Fargo lately, the snowbanks are like a circus snowbanks. <laughs> my, my mailbox has been buried since about Christmas. I like feet under the snowbank. So um, we've really, really started to make sure that our boulevards have room to, sto to, st to store snow. So if, if there's not room, the problem is getting pushed to the street department to come and blow it in a truck and haul it somewhere. So um, your question wasn't even that, any of those items. <laughs> um, but I'm just, so, I'm telling you, I, I taught my son, uh, we had fourth grade basketball this year, so it's like I'm, it's like I'm getting all my coaching philosophies out. Um, how do you get buy-in? It, it varies on uh, what you're gonna be doing to the street. Um, but like I said in the beginning, on-street parking and how that street use, gets used today is very important. Don't neglect how people are using things today. Um, and then collaboration. So uh, the last thing is uh, flexibility. You really just have to be flexible with your design. Oh yeah. Okay. We're on the uh, round robin one minute of last thoughts. Mike, you're first. I'll just say quickly, uh, Jake kind of touched on it and I mentioned it too, but right sizing your project is important. Uh, understanding that if you have a complete reconstruction, it kind of opens up that envelope for you to look at complete streets, but it doesn't mean you have to do everything. It may not fit that particular project or that corridor based on uh, coordination or input you've received from, your, from the public stakeholders, elected leaders, whatever it may be. But it also doesn't mean if you have a mill and overlay or a concrete pavement repair project that you can't implement some things. Uh, we've had a couple of those lately where it was just the next pavement treatment and we went in and we did a road diet. And those roads are acting and uh, working much more efficiently than they were prior to, uh, to that pavement treatment and it was an easy implementation and a simple change for us. So right sizing it on your projects is a key thing. So um, I think my last comment would be whenever you are in the pro situation where you're uh, taking an old street and making it different than it was before, do so with your eyes wide open. And hopefully we would encourage federal highways that every you know jurisdiction, state agency would have some kind of design guidance that would uh, they could refer to to make sure that they, they go at these projects with their eyes wide open. Um, how do you make a North Dakota DOT employee squirm just a little bit? No. <laughs> You, you, yeah, you, you suggested 11 foot lane or even, <laughs> my goodness, 10 and a half. <laughs> you got an enemy for life. Um, I, what Kevin just said, uh, eyes wide open, um, be creative, be flexible, be smart. We're all smart individuals. Um, think outside the box. And ultimately, you want a project that you're proud of. And we, we've built a lot of them in town. So thank you. Uh, yeah, eyes wide open, but also ears wide open. You know, hear, hear what are those needs? What, what, what do people want? You know, what is the future of this corridor, the surrounding corridor, the community? You know, there's a lot of times when, you know, a corridor isn't just that corridor, it's surrounding corridors. How, how do you want that to operate? And what are the needs? Um, you know, make sure you're communicating looking for those opportunities, bring forth opportunities, innovative ideas. Doesn't mean they're all going to be brought forth, but it opens up the door for, for more, you know, thinking of, of opportunities. You know, I think just keep your minds open and, and bring forth. Don't be afraid to, to throw something out there that's off the wall. I mean, Jeremy does it all the time, so uh, not all the time that comes to fruition, but sometimes it does. So, so you know, keep your, keep your minds open and, and your ears open and, and your eyes wide open. Okay, thank you. And, and then uh, Mike mentioned a, a little bit right sizing, and sometimes you can have a a mill and overlay project, or you can have a reconstruction project. Uh, but just as we out there, we have different kind of projects that can utilize these concepts, and, and we have the Highway Safety Improvement Program, uh, Transportation Alternatives Program, Urban Grants. Uh, we, we have a new one on the Rural Community Enhancement Program, Transit Grants. So there's lots of opportunities to take these concepts and, and get them on your streets. And, uh, 
with that, I would say uh, thank you to the panel. Let's uh, give it up for them if we can. And uh, thank for you all participating in the transportation conference. Uh, if I look at my watch and I push the button, it's, uh, I gave you one minute back. Thank you. <laughs>